Thank you, David. It's my pleasure to be here. I would like to begin by thanking you, Venkat, uh, and the organizers of this institute. So I, I wrote a couple of things on the boards to prepare for the lectures. So let's first take a look at the notation that I will be using, uh, standard notation, x, y, a pair of discrete random variables with a joint distribution, uh, the conditional entropy, the mutual information between x and y, uh, and the uh, vector forms, uh, this x to the n, it will denote a vector of length n. So these are two vectors jointly distributed with some uh, joint distribution, the conditional entropy, the mutual information. But here, uh, these are not definitions, these are uh, the chain rules. The conditional entropy can be written, can be written uh, as the sum of conditional entropies, uh, and the mutual information can be written as a sum of mutual informations. Normally, I, okay, I should really put the condition in here. Let's put it there. Uh, if the UIs are independent, uh, the condition in here can be removed, and this can be uh, put in conjunction with the YN. But this form is uh, whether the UNs, the UIs are independent or not, this is always true. The UI of the XI or? I. I. Yes. This should be. This is the X I minus one, and X I minus one is X one through X I minus one. Okay, so. Let's move this away, and uh, I would like to, for those who are impatient, uh, I would like to put up here the main theorem, and everything is really going to be a consequence of this one. So there are two theorems. One I call source polarization. Source polarization. So it all boils down to, I mean, if you were to explain this to somebody, let's say a mathematician who doesn't really have any background in information theory uh, and is not really interested in where it came from, uh, how would you uh, get his or her attention? So you definitely would want to write uh, in a compact form. Uh, what this thing is about. So I try to make exactly that in here. Suppose you have a random variable, x. This is going to be a source random variable. Uh, we will think of it as a reference random variable representing a discrete memoryless source. I don't want to be too general here. I will assume the source is a binary source. Okay, so as simple as it can be. And then we will have a sequence of outputs from this source, IID, meaning that the source is memoryless, and they will all have the same distribution as X. <coughs> a discrete memoryless source, a binary memoryless source. These are Bernoulli random variables, therefore. They take the values 0 and 1. Uh, and then uh, what we will do is we will pick a block length, N, it will be a power of two, in a power of two. And we will define a new random vector, a transformed random vector un of length n again. So this, my vectors are row vectors. This is a matrix, capital N times capital N. So this one is also a row vector. This matrix here, is the Kronecker power of that one. Everything is in uh, GF2. 
multi multiplications and additions. Uh, so what is the Kronecker power? Maybe we should also uh, illustrate that in here. So F has already been defined like this. Let's do a small uh, exercise. So uh, for n equal to 2, my vector is going to be u1, u2, uh, which will be given by x1, x2 multiplied by 1, 0, 1, 1. So this is going to be x1 plus x2 and x2. So this is addition modular 2. Uh, sometimes uh, I put a circle around it to indicate it. So that's it for n equal to 2. For n equal to 4, 4 is equal to 2 to the 2. So small n is equal to 2. I will be computing u1, u2, u3, u4, x1, x2, x3, x4. And here, the second Kronecker power of f. Uh, so how is it defined? In general, it's defined like this. The nth Kronecker power is defined as f. So you, it is defined as the as this m minus one Kronecker product f, and the Kronecker product of, and this one is simply f m minus 1 f to the power m minus 1 is 0 here, f m minus 1. What is the definition of the Kronecker product? So you can take any two matrices and the Kronecker product is simply a1 1 times b, a1 2 times b, and so on. Okay, so the, uh, each element of this one is multiplying the entire matrix B. Is it clear? Okay, so, uh, so uh, is this one clear then? So uh, this matrix here is going to be capital N times capital N in size. So what we have is, uh, we had a random vector xn, and it had iid components. We passed it through a transformation to obtain this un. This transformation here is a one-to-one -one transformation. It is an inverse. So the inverse of this matrix is itself. You can verify it. Take this matrix and multiply it with itself. You get the identity. The inverse of the nth Kronecker power is itself again. These are simple to verify. So we have a one-to-one -one transformation. Okay. So uh, why did we do this? Okay. So now. Uh, in the background, intuitive background, what I want to do is I want to compress this vector, source coding, but that I find difficult. Instead, I'm going to be do source coding on this one, UN. Uh, it will be much easier to do source coding on this because of this statement here. So you take any delta, fix it. Fix it as a small number. <coughs> and consider this ratio here. What is it? Well, these are the uh, conditional entropy terms. There are n of these ones. OK, so i ranges from 1 to n. So there are n such terms. So we are looking at the fraction of terms for which the conditional entropy lies between delta and 1 minus delta. Take delta as something like 1%. So this range is 
a pretty wide range compared to, you know, the interval zero, zero 01. So this is zero, this is one. And then uh, this is delta and one minus delta. So anything that lies in this range, I include, I count it in here. One would expect this fraction to be large because it occupies almost all of the interval here. But that's not the case. So in the limit as n goes to infinity for a fixed delta, that fraction is zero. Okay, it goes to zero. So there is almost nothing in this interval for any delta, no matter how small it is. This is called source polarization. The entropy is polarized to the extremes. So they, since they are not here in this interval, they must be either here or there. Why should they be in here? The entropy of a binary random variable is upper bounded by one. Okay, so this number is definitely less than or equal to one. All, all logarithms are to base two, and we are considering the binary alphabets. Okay, right? So this thing is also a binary vector. So uh, all the entropies are either near zero, almost all of them, or near one. In fact, this holds not only with fixed delta, but you may let delta become small as you let n go to infinity. You can let delta also become small like this. This is roughly, it's difficult to understand what this thing is. So let's use a little less precise way of writing it. I can, roughly speaking, I can let delta go to zero exponentially in the square root of the block length, and this statement is still true. I'm not going to give the proof of this one. Uh, that's, uh, we will leave it to uh, the second lecture or the third lecture. Uh, what I really want to make sure is uh, that uh, we understand the statement here and see how it can be useful for coding. So first of all, uh, do we have any questions about this statement here as to the meaning of it? Uh, is it clear? Okay, so the entropies are polarizing. They are moving to the extremes. Okay, so let's then address the question, the, uh, the question of whether it would be any easier to do source coding directly on UN, on UN rather than directly on XN. Okay, so the, the idea is, I will describe this, but let me move on, if you like, to, uh, to show a counterpart of the same result for channel coding. So there is just one, one more thing which I would like to add here before moving to the channel coding part. So there is a corollary to this one. If you, uh, if you believe this one, the corollary says the following. Uh, the fraction of coordinates for which the conditional entropy is between delta and mi one minus delta is basically zero. There is nothing in here. So which fraction should be in there and which fraction should be in here? Well, the total, the total entropy is fixed. Okay, so let's prove the corollary before moving on. So, Erdogan, let me warn yes. you a little bit. Since hmm. you're moving the boards a lot, let yes. me warn you by not writing on the stuff behind the whiteboard. No, I'm not going to do that. That will cost a lot of money and uh, <laughs> that will come off your salary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, don't worry about that. Okay, so let's let's do some further uh, analysis on this. So we have uh, okay H the entropy in this vector U because we have a one-to-one -one transformation is the same as the entropy in X because the transformation is one-to-one. -one. This one, we are assuming that we have a memoryless source x1, x2, they are all IID. Hence, uh, the entropy in the joint ensemble is simply the sum of the entropies in the individual coordinates. And each coordinate is distributed the same way as x, hence the total entropy is n times hx. Okay, so this is entropy conservation. is entropy conservation. Now, the, by the chain rule, we also have the following. Okay, so this is the chain rule. Okay, if we put the, these two together, we can write this. Therefore, what I know is the sum of these terms is equal to n times the original entropy. So, uh, so can we conclude the following then? Therefore, I mean, given that uh, Almost all of them are either near zero or near one. I'm talking about these terms. Can we reach this conclusion? That those near one, that those near one should be roughly, and there should be some uh, qualifications here, like delta near one. Okay, so the number of them uh, maybe not, uh, not even this one. Okay, so those near one, if you take delta small enough, then it's fair to say that the entropy terms that are near one, the fraction of them is approximately equal to h of x. Because there is nothing in here, and those that are in here, the total entropy you can accumulate by summing these ones is at most delta times n. Right? The sum of the entropies here can it must be delta times n. There is a negligible fraction of entropy terms in here, so don't e even count them. So uh, this much entropy has to be accounted for has to be accounted for almost almost all of it must be due to the terms that are residing in here. Okay, so that's uh, what this one is saying. Okay, so the... Uh, question. Uh, do you have a good characterization of this set of all i's where the entropy is high? No. Uh, okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's something which we will discuss. Okay, that's, that's definitely an important point. Okay, but all I can say is uh, we can compute where they have large entropy, uh, in uh, order n time, order n complexity, where n is the size of the transform. So we have an efficient algorithm for computing it. Uh, but we don't ha really have a formula that you can just write down and find out which coordinates are the high entropy coordinates. Okay, so I, I, well, if you like, let's stay on, on this subject and see how we can use this one to, to do source coding. Good question. Yes. Is, why is, is there an intuitive reason why you can expect this polarization to happen? Well, I will, I will show it. I will show it, okay? I want to uh, purposefully avoid such questions because I want to show 
what you can do if it is true. Okay. Otherwise, uh, otherwise, you know, we get lost. Okay. So I want to show you the final result, and if you find it interesting, uh, you would, you will read the proof anyway, somewhere. Okay. You always have that option, but before you leave, uh, I have limited amount of time. Uh, I want to make sure that you understand, you know, what the main theorem is. Okay. Uh, so how can we use this for source coding? Okay, so application to source coding. So suppose, you know, I, I have computed those coordinates. Let's call them H. These are the coordinates I, such that the entropy is, is large. Let's be a little imprecise, okay? These are the coordinates, the high entropy coordinates, where the conditional entropy is approximately equal to one. Okay, so what we know is uh, the the number of such elements is approximately equal to n times the entropy of the original source. Okay, so this is a summary of everything that I have said. All right, so how can we do source coding? Uh, so we have computed this set. Okay, somebody asked, is it easy to compute the set? No, it's not that easy, but suppose we have computed that. We have it. So we will do the source coding as follows. So let's first draw a picture to explain uh, exactly what I mean by source coding. But there will be, you know, this xn coming from the source. We are going to transform it to obtain un. Okay. And uh, there will be a source encoder here, a polar source encoder, if you will. This is going to send out a number of bits. Okay, so in fact, let me write exactly what it will send out. It will send out these bits. What is that? This u sub h, it's, this is the sub vector of the u vector consisting of coordinates in the high entropy set. Okay? So, and then there will be a decoder here, which is going to first reconstruct the U vector. And since it's a one-to-one -one transformation, it will apply the inverse, which is this, to obtain an estimate of the original source. Okay, so this is the uh, structure, the architecture for the source code that we want to use. So to make it absolutely clear, uh, let's say n is equal to 8. Let's take a small number. Uh, okay, and let's suppose the high entropy set consists of the coordinates uh, 3, 5, uh, Okay, uh, seven, eight. Okay, maybe four, six. The high entropy set is usually, uh, no, just the other way around. Usually the small coordinates, let's say one, two, uh, one, two, three, and five. Okay, so suppose that this is the case, that I have computed the uh, high entropy set, and these are the high entropy indices. So the way the proposed source coding algorithm will work is as follows. Okay, so for each i, so for i from 1 to n, do the following. If 
phi belongs to the high entropy set. Okay, high entropy set. The entropy is approximately equal to one. Send u sub i. This is really a realization. So I have here, so the encoder. This is going to be run, of course, not with the, uh, not with the random vector, but with the realization of the random vector. Okay, so a small case. So these are the capital case letters indicate the random variables. But for an operational system like this, if you like, let's replace all of these things with small case letters so that we have, okay, so everyone, the X's and the U's here are specific realizations. So the encoder is called with a specific input. Now we look at the first coordinate. If the first coordinate is a high entropy coordinate, it is in this case, we send u sub i as is, without any, any change, okay? It is sent over here. So u1 is going to be sent out uh, by the encoder because one is a high entropy coordinate. Else, uh, if it is not a high entropy coordinate, Okay, maybe I should uh, change this statement a little bit uh, because uh, let's redefine this H. Uh, I erased it already, but let me define it as follows. It's the set of coordinates such that H of UI conditional on the past is greater than delta. Okay, so not one minus delta, but delta. Why did I do this? Uh, because I also want to send uh, in the clear, all coordinates uh, with entropies uh, greater than delta. Delta may be small. Okay, so delta may be, for example, uh, one half. So if I don't send these coordinates the, for the decoder, it will be hard to guess them correctly. Uh, by changing the definition from one minus delta to, de to delta, I have not really increased the cardinality of the set much because you see the cardinality here is roughly n times hx, but the same thing is true also for this one. Okay, because the fraction that lies in here is almost zero. So for any high entropy coordinate, uh, we will send it as it is. Else, uh, what we will do, we will skip it. Okay, and then we will continue. So this is the loop. Okay, so in this case, uh, what I would be sending out would be u1, u2, u3, and u5. That's all. So I'm sending four bits, uh, four coordinates of the computed u vector. And now it's the decoder's task to estimate the entire vector, the missing coordinates of the u vector. Will it be able to do so? Okay, so uh, the coordinates that are missing from here are the ones for which the conditional entropy is less than delta. So if it were zero, if the conditional entropy were zero, what would it mean? It would mean that you know that uh, the ui would be a function of the previous u's. Uh, having it less than delta is something close to being deterministic. All of this needs to be justified, of course. Okay, so that's the detail of the proof, uh, which I don't intend to give today. Okay, so those coordinates which I skipped over are the low entropy coordinates for which 
this conditional entropy is less than delta. And I'm hoping that uh, the decoder will not have much difficulty in reconstructing the missing coordinates here. OK? So, uh, so one task which we need to uh, tackle later on is estimate the probability of decoding error here. OK? So based on the assumption that the missing coordinates have conditional entropy less than delta, what will be the probability of error in the reconstruction? I give you the answer. The probability of error is less than uh, 2 to the minus square root of n, provided that, provided that uh, there is nothing provided. So we are, uh, yeah, as it is, you know, we can prove this one. We are sending enough coordinates. I was going to say, provided that we are sending data, uh, data at a rate above the uh, entropy of the source, but we are already doing it, okay? Because we are sending all the high entropy coordinates. So the rate of communication in here is above the entropy of the source. The decoder, we will show later on, uh, will be able to reconstruct you with a probability of error uh, that goes to zero exponentially in the square root of the block length. So this is something that needs to be proven. Have anyone like, uh, did like imperial calculation to understand this set H? That is there any conjectures like how this set H looks like? Yeah. How we set H? Looks like like is there any conjecture? Well, it, it is. It is not an interval. Okay, so it is like a chaotic set with many holes in it. Okay. Yeah, of course, like binary, so it has only meaningful for binary representation, right? What do you mean by binary representation? The set, the set is an irregular set. It is not like all the indices from one to some number and then omit the rest. It will be, it will have many holes in it. Okay, like four is missing in here. For a large n, there it will have, it will show almost no structure. Okay, except most of the uh, small numbers are going to be in the entropy set, and large numbers will be outside it. So uh, after we reconstruct this, the rest is easy. So by the probability of error, of course, I mean that this estimate is not equal to the original input. OK, so this is the uh, source coding algorithm. So the, uh, the OK, so, yeah, one more thing which I wanted to say. How many bits are we sending in here? We are sending as many bits here as the cardinality of the set. What is the cardinality of the set? It's approximately equal to n times hx bits. So we, are, we have compressed the source to its entropy limit. OK, so the only thing which uh, remains is to prove this one, okay, which we will do later on. So I, 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 this completes the part about uh, what I want to do today about source polarization. Uh, but before I move on to the channel polarization part, maybe I should, uh, I should pause. And if you have any questions, please. Yes. So that, that statement also holds with beta exactly equal to one half? Or? So yes, for any, for any delta. <coughs> you no. mean, ah, this one? Yeah. Okay, no. Uh, but this is, this is too ugly to write down. Okay, so this is an approximation. For any beta strictly less than a half, uh, the statement is true. It is not true if beta is equal to one half. Uh, but okay, so this approximation uh, yeah, is a shorthand for writing all of this. Okay. And you are using that green statement for that probability of error, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, this is also okay. Uh, approximate. Okay. You only need the exponential because you do union bound. Uh, it's only multiplying n terms to it, right? So yes. Yeah. Th this is obtained by. 
Freezing is fine. Right? The <coughs> is not exactly one part. No, no, no. But any positive beta will give you the conclusion because you're union bound. So what I'm yeah. sure that the problem you decode yeah, the whole thing correctly is going to have a square. For any beta, would uh, I can put in here any beta. I mean, okay, so the delta there, there is also a delta. Okay, so that's the, uh, there is also this delta in here. I would want to make this delta shrink to zero. Okay, and I can only let this shrink to zero uh, at that rate with beta less than a half. Okay, and uh, this delta shows up in the union bond here. Okay, so if you want to be precise, replace this, all my square root ends with this statement here, okay, with this one. Yeah, no, just yeah. yeah. So, uh, as David indicated, the uh, final result, it's just a little, uh, one little step uh, ahead. You know, all you need to do is uh, find a bound on the probability of error in estimating this from its past, assuming that it is correct. Uh, under the assumption that this entropy is less than delta. Okay, if you have reconstructed uh, the sequence up to i, index i, correctly, the conditional probability of making an error at the ith step, uh, what you need to do is give, it, give a bound on the probability of error at the ith step, uh, under the assumption that this entropy is small. Okay, so that's, uh, that's something really minor, but uh, we will get to it, okay? So the main idea, let's uh, summarize it then. Uh, we had this original source. Uh, we transformed it into a new source. This was memoryless. This is no longer memoryless, but it is polarized. The conditional entropies are either near zero or near one. Okay, so that gives, suggests this source coding algorithm. All I need to do is send the coordinates, which cannot be estimated by the decoder. They are high entropy coordinates. They have entropy close to one. In fact, even if they had entropy, let's say 0.75, uh, it would be too risky to not send them. Uh, uh, it is not only that uh, they have so they have entropies close to saturation, almost one, okay? So uh, they are purely random. That pure randomness ensures that we are not, by sending them, we are also not losing much from efficiency because they are incompressible. The bits that we send already have conditional entropy equal to one, so by sending them without any coding directly, uh, we are not losing any efficiency. Okay, so they are already saturated in terms of entropy. Okay, so it's clear what polarization does here. Okay, so what questions remain here? There are, uh, there is the proof of this statement, okay, uh, with, in the stronger form, and then the proof of this statement. So let's just modulo this. Uh, this is source polarization. Okay, now I want to turn to this channel polarization. There is a counterpart uh, of the source polarization theorem. So now, instead of a single random variable, we have a pair of random variables, x and y. So here we think of x as the input to a memoryless channel. X, W, and Y. So this channel here, W, it is part of the condition, uh, the joint probability assignment. The channel input has a probability distribution that you can select arbitrarily. But the conditional probability of the channel output, given the input, is fixed. That we call W, the channel. This is a, this is going to be a discrete memoryless channel. Okay, and uh, 
So the conditional probability of a vector of channel outputs will have a product form. Once again, uh, to make the presentation simple, I will assume that the input here comes from a binary alphabet. The alphabet here is 0, 1. This is the channel input alphabet. The channel output alphabet, this may be arbitrary. It may even be continuous, like a binary input additive Gaussian noise channel. So we don't put any restrictions whatsoever on the output, uh, except my notation would have to change, uh, and I would have to use some uh, densities and so on. So let's assume, uh, to, be, uh, to be precise, that the output in this presentation is also discrete. Okay. You may assume even that this is a binary symmetric channel, if you wish. Uh, so let's begin reading the statement. We have uh, a reference ensemble, an X and a channel input and a channel output. And then, uh, this is a vector ensemble of IID pairs. Each element of the vector uh, is identically distributed as the XY here. Okay, so we are not discussing channel coding at the moment. Okay, so uh, we are uh, just as in here. Uh, at some point, I will refer to a channel coding algorithm, but we are not there yet. So don't think of this as a code. Rather, think of it as a memoryless ensemble. Okay, a product form ensemble on the channel input. So what we do here is similar. Uh, instead, of, instead of this xn, we think of that as the input to a bigger channel. Let me draw a picture here, which should make it clearer. So it is like this. We have we have n copies of the channel. This is how I think about it. Okay. So the, there are n uh, independent copies of the channel. Uh, this is the input ensemble and the output ensemble. Uh, what we do here is we apply a transformation. Okay, so and then we have another ensemble here, a U ensemble. So since this transformation is uh, identical, the inverse is the same as the the transformation, uh, the order of things, you can really think either going this way or that way. Okay, so that's the U here. U is defined as X multiplied by this transformation. Okay, so the, uh, the statement, the claim here is the following. For any fixed delta greater than zero, the mutual information from UI to the entire output and the past inputs here, uh, lying between delta and 1 minus delta divided by n, so this is a fraction here, that fraction goes to 0 as n goes to infinity. Okay, so this needs to be interpreted carefully, yes. Do you mean to say u equals xf or x equals uf? Okay, so where, where is it? In your diagram, it seems that <laughs> x is the output from u. Okay, so it's kind of misleading, but uh, we have this one. Since f I know, inverse, you want the causal way of looking at it. Well, I really, in this, I really want to look at this as the input to that transform, to be, uh, 
to be honest, yes, yes. That's the way I want to look at it. Oh, so you really mean this? Yes, okay. I mean this, yes. yes. But that's a bit strange, right? Because I thought U is the input and then X and it goes through a channel. Well, here the primary ensemble is the X ensemble, okay? So think of this, uh, what did I do in here? X was the source ensemble, okay? I had no observations, side information, if you like, Y, N. So I transformed this into a U ensemble. That's exactly the same thing that I want to do here. But in uh, applying channel coding on this, I will reverse this. I will take this as the input, and I will generate the axis. Okay, so I, this is the way it is. I really mean it, yes. Okay. So this, this ensemble is defined. I define a new ensemble, the U ensemble, okay? So what is the meaning of this? What is the operational meaning of these terms over here? So the first term, the U1 given all the, all the outputs here. This is YN. Okay, so I, I, Okay, so this is the, 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 this is a mutual information. This is the achievable rate on a channel whose input is U1 and whose output is YN. There is an effective binary input channel. Think of the binary input channel with U1 as the input and YN as the output. Okay, so these terms, in thinking about the channel, these are acting as interference. Okay, so you have U2 through UN, which are random variables. I don't, uh, I want to erase the errors here. Okay, so there is, uh, that was for interpretation, but Okay, so I have, I have a channel here, okay, with input U1 and with all these things as the outputs. I, now, there is an ensemble here, okay, so a well-defined ensemble, a joint probability distribution on Xn and Yn. I'm keeping that distribution. There is also a joint distribution. Look, it is like this, Un, okay. Now you can think in the other direction too, David. I mean, a memoryless channel and YN. You see in probability there is no causality. Okay, so a joint distribution, uh, you see whether I begin with X's and define this ensemble in terms of the X ensemble or change the order it doesn't matter, okay? So uh, for channel coding purposes, it's more natural to think in this direction, of course. But the UN has been defined uh, relative to the XN ensemble. Okay, in, if this transformation was not itself inverse, I would have written here uh, a different equation, of course. So I, would have written, I would have written UN as uh, Xn inverse like this. Maybe you should anyway, right? Maybe I should. Okay, so uh, because in uh, applying coding, I will begin with this one, and I will generate the code word using this equation. Okay, so let me start again. I, I'm given a reference ensemble, okay? I want to keep this fixed. So I'm going to be playing around uh, with this. Uh, so this is basically my choice. We could have used here different transforms. Uh, we could have used here different transforms. And this is not the only transform for which uh, this statement is true. In fact, uh, for any random transform, you will have this statement in a stronger form. 
much stronger form. The main point about this transformation is it's easy to compute. The complexity will show up at some point, so we can do the uh, computation here in n log n time and the decoding also in n log n time. Uh, so, uh, okay, so let's, let's look over here. So there is this first channel with input u1 and output consisting of all yn's. Uh, supposing that you decode this correctly, you gain access to another bit channel, the second bit channel, which has this, this capacity. Supposing that you have decoded U1 correctly, now you gain access to this channel, U2, the mutual information from U2 to all the channel outputs, conditional on knowledge of U1. And this goes on and on. So we generate these terms in here. Let me put uh, a conditional uh, conditioning in here. For, uh, for xi, iid, Bernoulli one half, uh, the xi's, uh, the ui's are also Bernoulli a half, so one can remove the conditioning because of independence, but not in general. So anyway, what we are counting in here are exactly the channels whose capacities are near one. And this corollary here is the counterpart of the entropy corollary. So it says the channels for which the capacity is near one is approximately equal to n times the capacity of the original channel. Not exactly the capacity, but the mutual information. Question? Okay. Yes. U's are not uh, independent, so if you put a conditioning, it's different, right? So here I'm really uh, trying to be more general uh, than uh, in the following sense. I'm not assuming that this distribution is Bernoulli a half. Okay. Uh, so the, uh, when you compute the transform here, this one, the elements of this transform are not IID. The, X, the elements of X are IID, but the elements of U are not IID. Hence, uh, we cannot remove this, okay? So the, if the U's are, if the UI's are independent, it's okay to remove this conditioning. But otherwise, you, you have to keep this in here. It is like side information given to you by perhaps a helpful genie or some, uh, somebody. And the meaning of this in channel coding terms is this is the achievable rate on a channel in which you are coding this input, ui. All previous inputs are given to, to the decoder correctly. And the succeeding inputs are treated as interference, as noise. <coughs> okay, so that's the operational meaning of this one. This is the achievable rate on a channel with input UI. What is available to the decoder is this observation here, plus knowledge of these ones. But these ones uh, are treated as random noise, as pure noise. You have not yet come to that. So the statement is similar to this statement. Okay, so you either have almost perfect channels whose capacities are near one, or channels whose capacity is near zero. So if you are going to do channel coding, what you do is clear. Uh, you use only the coordinates for which the mutual information here is near one. So you select those coordinates uh, for which this information is near one, and you send your data uncoded uh, through them. What do you do for the remaining ones? Well, the capacity is near zero, so what you do is you fix them. You set, for example, the mutual information, let's say this one, is near zero, 
Uh, what we do is we fix this input to zero. U2, let's say the mutual information is also near zero. We fix that one to zero two. If I is a uh, is an index for which the mutual information is near one, we want to use this channel. So here uh, we select this from a Bernoulli distribution. We select it from some distribution. Okay, so uh, if I assume that these are all Bernoulli a half, let's assume that to make it simpler. Okay, so uh, say these are all Bernoulli a half, then uh, this transformation here, this transformation will generate Bernoulli half IID u sub i's here. So you want to apply coding on these, and you can select it also as Bernoulli a half. In freezing some coordinates, you can select the, the value of those coordinates from this distribution and fix it. In other words, you don't have to set them equal to zero all the time. You may select them at random and freeze them uh, by a random choice. Uh, OK, so, so what you really want to ensure is the following, that the probabilities that you use in coding and you are operating on the inputs u, they should generate the same reference distribution over here. OK, if these are not Bernoulli a half, the choice of the distribution on these coordinates is a lot more complicated, of course. OK, sometimes you want to apply an input distribution on the channels, which is not the uniform distribution. You can do that. Uh, through uh, the use of this one, but the conditional probabilities of each UI conditioned on the past, uh, uh, you have to select the coordinate accordingly, okay, not uh, from the uniform distribution. But anyway, I think I have come to the end of my time, so I will stop here. I hope I, I have been able to explain the, uh, the main theorems. So next time, uh, I will talk about the proofs, the details, etc. So I stop here. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, we, this is our, actually our first speaker that ends le within the time limits. Of the <laughs> one hour, so congratulate him. Is there any questions? To clarify, yes. So, so, okay. so, so, so like, organization here. So, is the assumption that u of x is less than one half or something to be sub x, right? I didn't hear the question, can you? What is the assumption of p sub x on the first line of the source co-organization statement? So, we should be assuming. There is, here, there is no assumption that it is a distribution. The random variable here is a, uh, is a zero, one random variable. There is no assumption on this one. If it's Bernoulli half and half, wouldn't that limit be 1 rather than 0? No, I, I, you mean if this were uniform distribution? Then, you know, that's not really a very interesting case. But let's see if anything in here is wrong. Uh, huh? Everything will be 1, so there's still nothing in this range. The limit is still 0. Because there's nothing in the yeah. On the output is 1. So this entropy, this entropy would be one in that case. Okay, this would be one. So and in that case, there is no need to do any compression. These things are already saturated; they have entropy one, and the UN here, it's also going to have the same distribution. So you will basically be sending all the U's. Okay, sending all the U's is equivalent to sending all the X's. So you have immediate polarization. You have immediate polarization. You don't really need to go through this. You simply send the axis directly. It's There's better. No right? For any finite n, you have polarization already. Yes, yes. yes. Any for, for any finite n. But your question was really whether this holds for that case. It, it holds, yes. Because these entropies are one, OK, in the case that you are referring to. Yes. I understand about the limit for very large n, but what is known about how fast this goes to zero? This says it already. 
It is already says how fast it goes to zero. This is about the delta. It's this part here. Yeah, this part says. So this the limit. So, okay, so how fast does it go to zero? This one? Okay, I see. Okay, there are two numbers. Uh, there, there, there is some work on it. Uh, okay, yes. So what is, in other words, this goes to zero, but how fast does it go to zero? Uh, okay, so the, the fraction that remains in here, that's what I'm indicating here, that goes to zero is this number here. Okay. No, no, so, so okay, so it has to be poly one over delta for that state. I mean, if you want that yeah. that fraction to be less than, say, delta, you can okay. make the whole thing happen with endless poly one over. But why should we oh. call that fraction also delta? Isn't that yeah, maybe you should want to call it eight uh, epsilon. But it kind of comes. It's, it's it's okay to merge those because you will give up on all those things in the middle anyway, and and you think of the extra error, so it's it's not. It's not a bad thing. But the order is not exponentially small. Yeah, that's right. So maybe you want to call that epsilon. So this, this question comes up when you deal with gap to capacity type of issues. Okay? So the scaling business and so on. Uh, I haven't really looked at it that carefully. Uh, sorry. But there are some papers by. Rudiger, Urbanke, Venkat, Kuruspavni, and so on. There is a lot of, a lot, a great number of papers on the subject. So, okay. So, so that's the gap to capacity business. Yes, and yes. So, I have a quick question, just yes. maybe a little clarification. So, if you want these XIs to be I, exactly I, they put only one half. So, in the. Right, that's your assumption there, right? The XIs are IID. Here. There is no such assumption in the way this theorem is stated, and it is correct okay, as it is written. I thought you were assuming IID pairs. The XIs are IID, but they are not Bernoulli half. No, 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 I, yeah. Yes, yes exactly okay, Bernoulli yes, half. yeah. Then it, these guys cannot be exactly Bernoulli one half, right? No. No. Yeah, no. no. <laughs> these no. are, if these are not Bernoulli half, these are not even independent. But if they were Bernoulli one half? If they are Bernoulli a half, then these are also Bernoulli a half. They are? They are. And these are, uh, well. Independent? Yes. Are you considering? Uh, kind of delta epsilon, right? Look, if, if we are not conditioning on yn, okay, so if these are, if we are just considering the marginal distribution yeah, of this one, right, right. the marginal distribution of this one is iid Bernoulli, Bernoulli a half. If Xn is IID Bernoulli a half. Because this is a one to one transformation of the space. Right, fine, I agree. Okay. Yes. So, one more question. How is the channel polarization then used to use the channel coding? Okay, so the. Uh, almost the same way as source polarization. Uh, if some of these numbers are big, close to one which correspond to having almost perfect bit channels, okay? I'm just focusing on the case of all the XIs are Bernoulli one half, but you do have a binary symmetric channel which corrupts them. So your UIs are also binary one half. Yes, but we are not sending information by using each and every one of them. So these are, I understand your question. So let's say, these are, let's say, binary symmetric channels with capacity a half. Okay. So you can only send uh, at rate one half. So you'll be sending information, data, in n over two coordinates over here. Okay. In approximately n over two of these coordinates. The remaining ones are going to be frozen. And the decoder will know how they, they have been frozen. In order to make this, you know, the proof work, the, the analysis tractable, what you do is uh, you do a performance analysis of random choices for the 
freezing pattern. Okay? Do you see what I mean? Sorry. The UI is getting corrupted, right? I mean, because of the final symmetric channel. The channel corrupts the... So I'm, I'm a bit confused. The channel, what, what the does channel it do? Corrupts the XI. Corrupts the XI. Right? Yes. The channel corrupts the XIs, but this is a virtual channel, okay? So the channels that you see here, these are synthetic channels. These are not the original channels. These are synthesized. I see, okay. Okay, so it is like, these are, are raw material, if you like. They have a total capacity equal to n times the capacity of each. What we do is, we combine the capacities of these and then slice them apart in such a way that the synthetic channels, namely these ones, they either get very small capacity or full capacity. Okay, so you combine them and then you cut them into small pieces again. But you do it in such a way that uh, the entropy, the mutual information is redistributed in an uneven fashion in as unequal fashion as possible. Some of them get nothing, and the rest get, you know, as much as one can have, close to one bit of capacity. You cannot have more than one bit because the inputs are zero, one valued. Okay, so this is not difficult to do. Any channel coding scheme effectively does exactly the same thing. So there is no secret about this transformation. You put in here any randomly chosen transform with probability close to one, it is going to achieve this result. And it, in fact, it will achieve it in a much stronger fashion in the sense that uh, you see there will be no gaps. That question of how to compute the you know, high entropy set or the uh, perfect channel set, that entirely vanishes, okay? So it is much stronger polarization. A random linear code will do exactly that, okay? Uh, now, uh, what this one does, I didn't have uh, any chance to talk about that today. The reason why we use this transform in here is because this is a recursive transform. So it makes encoding and decoding easy, order n log n, okay? So, uh, and at the same time, it achieves a probability of error similar to this, uh, the numbers that you see here, two to the minus square root n. That's the probability of error. It is not as good as a random linear code because a random linear code can achieve a probability of error uh, the number here is proportional to n in the exponent. Okay, so this is the, in fact, we are losing something, but this is good enough in some sense. You still have some exponential rate of decay of probability of error, so this doesn't have an error floor, for example. Okay, uh, it is not optimal, but it, uh, it is low complexity, both encoding and decoding. Okay, good. All right, so we look forward to part two. Well, thank, okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.